years ago The sun would rise, that's all I needed to know Yesterday's close and I was good to go My wooden sword against the world And every day is like a holiday Dusty gone where we used to play Taking apples from the branch along the way Heading down to Dalek's I grew up in New Jersey. I was born in Newark. I'm the oldest of four children, two girls and two boys. My dad was a businessman. His first company was a fire alarm company. And we grew up knowing that our father, by selling fire alarms, was actually saving lives. My mom was a homemaker. She played canasta. She took care of her kids. And I was a happy kid. I enjoyed my life. But I always had a sense there was something outside of the suburbs that I wanted to taste. I wanted to understand. And so I chose a college that was in Boston, Simmons College, and I chose it primarily because it was a school for women only. And I felt there was something special about studying just with women and thinking about ideas rather than what I looked like all day. And I wasn't sure what I wanted to study. I studied a lot of English. I took a lot of English courses. But I ended up majoring in art history. They asked us to go to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts or the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, which is literally adjacent to Simmons College, and to stand in front of a painting for about three hours and write what we saw. I had no idea that I was learning writing pedagogy at that time in my life. I did not know that I was learning a technique that would turn me into a researcher and a writer by looking directly at what I was seeing and then trying to put it into language. But that was the training I had in art history. I graduated college in 1969, and I wasn't sure what I was going to do next. Eventually, I thought perhaps I wanted to teach. And since I had always been a reader, I thought about teaching English. So at first, I went to NYU, and I started taking courses in the master's program in arts and sciences, which was a very traditional approach to pedagogy and to literature. It was fine to do that, but I also was curious about teaching. I was curious about how people study, how people learn. And so I went over to the School of Ed to see what they offered, and I found kindred spirits there. I found Gordon Pradle and John Mayer, who were just starting their jobs at NYU. It was in a department of English education that had been created by Louise Rosenblatt. And I felt at home there. I felt as if I could study the questions I had about how people learn in that department. So I switched to an education program and received a master's in education in 1972. So growing up, I never thought I wanted to be a teacher. I'm not sure I had teachers I loved or respected in elementary or high school, and teaching wasn't something that I thought I wanted to do until I went to that program at NYU, and they said, well, it's time to student teach. So I said, OK. They sent me to a high school on the Lower East Side, Seward Park High School, which is the school that has a book written about it by Bell Kaufman called Up the Down Staircase. And there actually were up and down staircases and thousands of kids. And if you tried to go up the down staircase, you were crushed. So that's where I was sent. And I was very, very, very leery. I didn't know if I had any skill at all as a teacher. And the, my participating teacher in the program said, OK, here's the classroom. Go in and teach. I did not know what to do. But I looked out, and I saw these kids. I saw their faces. And I saw them sitting at desks. I opened my mouth, and I started to talk with them. And I knew in five minutes that I was home. So I thought I would be a high school teacher. Um, but to become a high school teacher in those days, you had to have several tests, several licensing requirements to go through. And I was so eager to teach that while I was doing the process to get certified as a high school teacher in New York City, 
I also realized I could become an adjunct at a college. And so before I received my master's degree, I applied for adjunct jobs at CUNY, which was hiring. And the first job I was offered was by Lynn Troika at Queensborough Community College, who was hiring me for an adjunct while I was still in my master's program. I, was, I went away that summer, I actually went to Israel, and I lived on a kibbutz. And I didn't want to come back. It was such a compelling experience. But I had this job at Queensboro, and I so much wanted to teach that I said, I'm coming back. So I came back in August of 1971. And I'm all excited about the course and the books, and I'm going to be a teacher at CUNY at Queensboro. When Lynn calls me and says, we didn't get enough enrollment. We can't hire you. I was, I was heartbroken. And she said, but I'd like to help you. So I recommend that you call all the other CUNY campuses. Some of them may have over-enrollment, and maybe you'll get a section that way. And tell them that I'm recommending you. So I said, OK. And I had a list of every single CUNY campus. I called every single English department. None of them had a course until I got to the last, last CUNY campus on the list was Eugenio Maria de Ostas Community College in the South Bronx. I had never been to the South Bronx, but it was the last one. I called them, and they said, we may have one section overfilling. It's Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 5 to 6 o'clock at night. And if we have 30 students, we'll keep it one section. But if we go over 30, we'll divide it into two. And so come on up, and let's see what happens. I went up dose dose. I sat in the back of that classroom praying that enough students would show up to make two sections, and that's what's happened. And so I had my first class in the fall of 1971 at Ostos Community College. I received my master's degree in June of 1972, and then I was hired full-time by Ostos as an instructor. At that time, we worked in 10-week modules, and they had numbers like 001 and 002, and there was a sequence with behavioral objectives and performance objectives, which sound more reminiscent or more like today than in the past, um, and we taught writing. At the time, my sense of it was that no one really was sure how to teach writing. It was kind of hit or miss. And one of the books we used was Troika and Noodleman Steps in Composition. I did whatever I was told to do. We tried topic sentences. We tried paragraph development. We did comparison and contrast. We did different modes. Um, and it seemed to me students either wrote or didn't write. I wasn't sure that the pedagogy itself was helping them, it wasn't necessarily harming them. But we were trying to figure out, how do you teach students who come to college to learn to write who actually can't write when they enter? And it was a big question and something that we all struggled with. So while I was teaching at Ostos, I also realized that I wanted to continue and pursue a doctorate in English education. I wanted to continue to work with the professors I had at NYU, and I wanted to deepen my understanding of how students learn and what it means to teach. So while I was teaching at Ostos, I also went part-time to NYU and began recognizing that what I was doing in the classroom was the ground from which to ask questions about teaching and learning. So very much the kind of work I was doing in my classroom became the fuel for thinking about learning, teaching, pedagogy, and writing. The PhD program I was in at NYU was influenced strongly by Louise Rosenblatt, who discussed the transactional theory of reading and how she was interested in how readers make sense of texts. And she created a program in which we were always asked to think about how we were responding to texts whether they were literary texts or a student writing, and to think about that the black marks on that page are there, and it's what we bring as readers that invest them with meaning, and that there was a true transaction that happens between readers and texts. And so that 
notion or that theory sort of fueled all of the pedagogy that I was exposed to at NYU and affected my own teaching, not only of writing, but the teaching of literature. You know, just as the way my teaching sort of created questions for me to bring back to my doctoral program, what I was reading in the doctoral program helped me frame what I was doing in the classroom. So the two of them worked amazingly well together. And I remember almost everything I read began to be something by which I could now look at the classroom. So when I read Piaget, I began to wonder if students who were better writers had more formal operations, and students who were not as skilled as writers had concrete operations. I kept trying to look at how the theories and the developmental theory and psychology or attitudes about writing would affect how students wrote. And I found all of it fascinating. Um, but I realized if I had did a dissertation on Piagetian developmental theory or attitudes, and I'd be looking at correlations between one set of factors and student writing. What I really wanted to understand was how students write. And Emig had pioneered a methodology by which she observed students composing and asked them also to think out loud, to compose out loud. And that was one of those moments when I read that she was asking the question, how do 12th graders write? I understood that that was my question regarding basic writers at CUNY. That as much as we were teaching sentence combining, paragraph development, comparison and contrast essays, we were teaching, we were teaching the form or the product of writing, we weren't looking at the process. And I wanted to understand how do the students who come to CUNY as basic writers go about the process of composing. And so once I read Emig, I realized I wanted to design a dissertation that followed to some extent what she had done. I wanted to have case studies, um, and I wanted to look closely at the students in my classroom. So I asked for volunteers in my basic writing class at Ostos and ultimately selected five students who would work with me individually outside of class on various kinds of writing assignments and I did ask them to compose out loud. I also had a tape recorder going so I could capture the sound of their composing, both the pen moving across the page and the sound of their voice. You know, some people ask, is composing out loud the same as composing silently? Does it interfere with the process of composing? And one has to admit, no, it's not the same. It could interfere if you're trying to think out loud while you're writing. But my students seemed to be able to do it without a lot of difficulty. It didn't make them terribly self-conscious. And they talked about what they were doing while they were doing it. One of the most important pieces of the dissertation was to figure out how to make sense of all these composing tapes and the written products. And I could have typed up a transcript from each student, but I was interested in looking at the process unfolding over time. And so I came up with a coding scheme. And I coded what was happening minute by minute as students composed. And ultimately, I had four or five composing codes for each student, and I had five students. So ultimately, I had a lot of data that would show me patterns, not just what students did, but how the behaviors repeated and echoed each other or changed. And I, in that, was able to document that students would go back in order to go forward. And in other words, I was able to document through these composing tapes that the writing process, at least for my students at that point in time, was recursive. So then I asked, well, if writing is recursive, what is it that students go back to? And sometimes they go back to the topic. They keep going back to it to repeat it, to get ideas to help them move forward. Sometimes they reread. They go back to lines they've already written in order, again, to hear the rhythm and to move forward. And sometimes 
I ultimately began to think that they go back sort of when they get very quiet internally to what I ultimately called a felt sense. And those were the behaviors that I thought were productive. But I also saw another set of behaviors that I thought were counterproductive, that did not help the students move forward in composing. And that was they would go back and reread and they would start editing at a surface level. And they would do that to such a degree that they would get worn down. So it, it began to be a kind of premature editing in my eyes that circum, circumvented or sort of short-circuited the composing that they were doing. When people looked at the drafts of basic writers, the kinds of students I was teaching at Ostos and others were teaching at the other campuses of CUNY, they would look at these drafts and say, these students do not know how to write. They don't have a composing process. This writing is haphazard. It doesn't make sense. It's, you know, it's full of errors. And so the conclusion was these students not only don't know how to write, they have no such thing as a composing process. And what I was able to show in my dissertation is that they absolutely do have, they did have and they do have composing processes. And they're rich and as full as ours in that there is a process they rely on in order to make sense of the work they're thinking about or writing about. The difference is there are two different ways that composing works. And when it's working well, it's recursive and students go back or writers go back to a felt sense. They go back to a sense of meaning that they're trying to develop. They go back to ideas and images that push or the writing forward or generate writing. But other times, particularly for unskilled writers, they go back to edit before it's time to they even know what they want to say. So they spend an awful lot of time trying to fix the language at the surface level and they don't have a fully formed set of rules to rely on so they get worn out by trying to fix something they don't know how to fix and then they sort of short circuit. And I thought so much that the, process, the reason for this was that they had taken in from their teachers a notion that writing has to be correct. And they didn't, couldn't sustain letting it be messy or unsure of where they were going while they were composing in order to find out where they wanted to go. Instead. So I was analyzing the data and trying to figure out what all of these composing tapes meant in 1975, 1976. And I began to speak about the early research in 1977, defended my dissertation in 1978. And I began to think about what does this say for the classroom? And I began to think that um, our models for writing, looking, trying to teach writing based on the rules for correcting finished products are not the same as guidelines for composing. That enabling writers to find what they want to say and to discover what they want to say is very different from teaching them the rules for editing finished discourse. It seemed to me that what we were teaching when we taught writing was the rules for editing finished discourse rather than engaging in guidelines for composing and that the process movement allowed us to see that writing is a process of discovery and in order to discover what we want to say we have to have a way to engage with what we don't yet know to allow room for ideas to emerge and when students were taught only the rules for editing finished prose, they had no access to this other part of what we might want to call now invention. So what was exciting about CUNY at that time was, first of all, that we really didn't know much about how students wrote. We didn't know a whole lot about the most effective ways to teach writing. And so we gathered together to talk about it and to try to understand what was happening on each campus. And since Ostos was small and I was excited about all these questions, I often went to what we then called CAUSE as the representative from Ostos Community College. And it was there that I met senior faculty members, you know, including people I became very close to and worked 
long and hard with, namely John Brereton and Richard Sterling, but I also came to know the people from Queens College, from Don McQuaid and Betsy Kaufman and Judith Fishman and met Ken Bruffy and other people around CUNY who were concerned about how to teach writing and excited about the questions. So I went to CAUSE and I met people and we compared notes um, and certainly with Mina and Dick Larson guiding us in many of the questions, we understood that there would be funding available to help us understand writing. And at one point, John Brereton, and Richard Sterling and I wrote a grant for FIPSI and we decided to look at writing across CUNY. And we came up with sample topics, we asked faculty to assigned these topics, we collected the writing, and we wanted to see if we could come up with a measure of syntactic maturity and rhetorical maturity. And we had lots of writing samples and we coded them and we spent a fair amount of time trying to do an analysis of the products. And it was fruitful, it was interesting. We realized that the language of basic writers was very complex and couldn't always be, couldn't always discover where their maturity showed itself. But at the same time, we received a grant to develop the New York City Writing Project. And the three of us were co-directors. And while it was a much smaller grant, it provided a much more dynamic playing field. Because we sat that first summer at Lehman College in 1978 in a classroom in Carmen Hall with 25 teachers, K through 12th grade. And we followed a pedagogy that was more or less dictated from Berkeley, from the National Writing Project, what was then called the Bay Area Writing Project. And the premises were, first, that writing teachers need to write. And that's, I think, pretty much a commonplace today, but not in all classrooms. But it was eye-opening to think that if you're going to teach writing, you should also be a practitioner. A second premise was that Everyone in the room, the professors included, who were writing, would share their writing in small response groups. In 1978, this felt like something that was anathema to us, that writing was private, it was personal, students might hand it in to a professor, but sharing writing was not something that people did easily or comfortably. And for us, it sounded a lot like Southern California hot tub culture. And we actually said to Jim Gray, well, you might share writing on the Bay Area or in Northern California, but in New York, we don't do that. And he looked at us, he looked, at, looked us in the eye, and he said, if you run a writing project, you will. So much to our great dismay, we, John and I particularly, ran that first summer institute, and we wrote with the teachers, and we went to writing groups, and we shared our writing, and that completely changed my pedagogy. You know, and it didn't matter if I was teaching basic writers or students in freshman comp or advanced writing or senior seminar or adult degree, students in an adult degree program. Having students bring their drafts, not fit completed pieces, but works in progress to a group, sitting in a small circle and reading their work out loud, to me, is a key to process pedagogy. And it's key in part because there is no substitute for looking at your words, reading them out loud, feeling them on your tongue, hearing them in your ear, and getting a sense of your own language. There is no substitute for other people listening to your work and then finding a way to give it back to you in a generous way. But more important than that, is it's a model of a democracy for me. And it's a model where every single person's voice counts and is respected. And to me, that is the, the emblematic moment of a writing classroom, where people's voices are respected and honored. So in 1978, when the writing project was founded at Lehman, I moved from most of us to Lehman into the academic skills department, which was a department of basic writing. And then a few years later, I moved into the English department. 
When I began to teach at Lehman in 1978, a number of the influences that had worked on me over the past years began to emerge in my practice. Certainly the writing project was a major influence, but so was process research because I realized I wanted my students to become observers of their own composing. So in our summer institute in the writing project, we started process journals. We had teachers writing about their own composing process to see if they could discover their own recursive moves. The same thing happened in my basic writing class. I wanted my students to understand how they were going about the process of composing so they could direct it and they could change it and they could talk, there was a vocabulary by which they could talk about composing. So actually, my pedagogy began to focus on how we write, what it means to compose, and what it means both practically, writing a, a paper, and what it means theoretically. How is it that we make meaning? What? The other piece that goes along with that is that how do you respond to someone's work in progress? And I found that first summer in the writing project that teachers became very easily became critical as if they were mimicking what their teachers did to them. And they could easily take a draft in progress and start saying what was wrong, start saying how they wanted to fix it, and take the focus away from the meaning. So we began in our project, and then I began in all of my classes, to teach teachers and then students how to listen to a draft as it's emerging. And the simple name for that is active listening, um, in schools I worked in, kids called it say back, but it felt very important to me that we learn how to become really good listeners of someone else's writing while it's being formed. And that is a generous and a generative process, and that became a really important part of my pedagogy. <laughs> when I think of CUNY in the 70s, I think of enormous excitement, I think of the many of the people, the faculty that I admired, who were often older than I was, but being charged with a sense of mission, of questions that we didn't know the answers to, and a general sense of excitement about what we were doing. And it was certainly, in my mind, led very much by Mina, who was physically beautiful and a bit mysterious. Um, I recall that nobody seemed to know a whole lot about her life, but that when she was at a meeting, she had her full attention, and she was articulate, and held, I think for all of us, a sort of a position of inspiration that if we could work with her, we knew we were fighting the good fight. And I recall my first Four Cs was in 1976 in Philadelphia, and I remember I went to a session where Mina was speaking, and again, there was this sense of purpose and excitement. And I thought to myself, I was still, I was at Ostos working, but I was still a graduate student, that this is an amazing field where people are thinking about teaching and learning and students' rights. And it was an enormously inspiring time to come to work. And it felt as if the world was full of possibility. So it's hard for me to believe this, but this is actually my 45th year at the City University. And I have to say that throughout just about every year when I have entered a classroom, it still feels the way it felt that first time I was a student teacher at Seward Park. I feel as if I'm in a particular kind of home, and I feel it's my job to welcome each of the students who enters that home for our short period of time together. And it gives me enormous pleasure to be in a classroom. I think I'm sometimes my best self in a classroom, that something emerges where I really, I don't have to pretend to be interested in what my students are writing. I am just interested in what they're writing and what they have to say and what their ideas are. I find their ideas often more interesting than my own. And so other than setting up the classroom, I take great pleasure in creating a setting in which my students are talking to each other, to me, with each other, where there's a new idea that emerges and we can take it and run with it. So that there's a kind of openness to 
intellectual engagement, which is what I think I was searching for when I you know, left my family and went to college, that there's something about the interplay of ideas that excites me, and there's something about fellowship. There's something about sitting together around a table um, that for me is a model of what it means to be part of a community where people are valued. Um, and it never fails to move me, and it never fails to give me pleasure. And so I feel enormously grateful that I kind of fell into um, the world of teaching writing, and that it has brought me in contact with so many thoughtful, funny, engaging, powerful, exciting people. And I, um, I just... It's just very, it's been a very meaningful career and I'm very grateful to have had it.